Hello and welcome uh, to our uh, SIG HPC Education Chapter webinar. Today's webinar is on physics in the classroom, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richard Gass, who will introduce the speakers. Uh, thank you, Steve. So we have um, three fairly distinguished speakers today who will be talking about computational physics and computational physics education. We have Dave Joyner, um, who is or, or at least was the uh, chemist, uh, Kenneth Eastbrook professor, professor of Science, Technology, and Mathematics Education at uh, uh, Keene University, but he is now um, the uh, Associate Dean for Integrative Sciences and Technology. Uh, he's been involved with computational uh, physics in the classroom for uh, many, many years. Um, we have Robert Panhoff. Panoff, who is the uh, president and executive director and founder of uh, Schoeder, um, who's basically spent his life uh, enabling computational physics. And uh, we have Ruben Landau, uh, who is a distinguished emeriti professor um, and prolific uh, textbook author. Um, <clears throat> who also founded really uh, Oregon State's uh, computational physics efforts um, and who has a new book coming out or a revised book on computational problems for physics. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, who is uh, Dave Joyner. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to talk about uh, something today. Uh, that I've been getting more and more involved in over the years, which is um, how to use uh, Unity as a modeling tool. And there's some issues with this with physics education that has been worked out. And I want to show an example of that specifically related to uh, the Leonard Jones potential and modeling it in 3D. So this particular model was inspired originally in a, uh, in a uh, special topics course on computational physics I was teaching years back, where we were taking... Ruben's uh, 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 classic text, and in particular, looking at the 2D Leonard Jones model that uh, was included in that and saying, you know, how do we start expanding this and thinking about it in 3D? Um, so in the process of doing that, uh, looking at different engines and ways of visualizing it and how to run it, uh, we started off looking at this with Unity Game Engine. Uh, I'm going to bring up a screen here. And so I wanted to say a little bit about the pros and cons of Unity as a physics model, not necessarily as a game engine or or, or even a VR tool, which is great for both of those. But when we think about it with physics model, uh, there's some really nice features that it has, right? And if you've not used Unity before, it is a 3D game engine that includes the ability to have objects hosted in a 3D world with attached scripts that can run and that you can program in C-sharp. Um, uh, can also work in 2D uh, also. So the nice thing about it, you've got integrated C-sharp editing. So we're working with uh, not necessarily C or Fortran level speed, but still a reasonably optimized, strictly typed language that'll get very good performance. Uh, and some decent optimizations to be able to, to, to run on uh, modern PCs, uh, including some built-in uh, classes for dealing with three-dimensional math and a, and, a, and a nice vector class. Uh, the rendering, of course, is, is really top-notch. Uh, it's designed so that it can run on a wide range of platforms. So it'll run on Mac, it'll run on Linux, it'll run on Windows, program for an Xbox or a PlayStation, right? Because it's designed to run on lots of things. Uh, and for my students, also very important. It's free for personal use uh, up to a certain point. Basically, when you start running your own business and have a revenue stream of 100000 a year, uh, then you have to license it. But for student and personal use, it's free. And there are education license grants available. I've never had one turned down. Uh, so we have you know properly licensed copies that we use on campus that we've never paid a penny for. Uh, the cons, though. Um, the native math for this, it's designed for video games, and everything is floating point, not double precision. Uh, if you've ever done any computational physics in floating point, it doesn't take long before that becomes a problem. Um, it's a single threaded process, uh, which is not a deal breaker, but is still uh, can create, create some issues. 
And, uh, you know, the math libraries are somewhat primitive. I mean, it's kind of like working with Java in that sense. But the nice thing is there's workarounds for all of those things. And that's kind of what I want to be able to, to say a little about in the context of this Leonard Jones model. Um, if you want to look at this, I've got uh, uh, some blog posts and GitHubs available for you. Um, you can either screen snap the, the QR code there. If you Google Joiner DA GitHub, you'll find my GitHub. Uh, and there's an item there for the Unity Modeling Toolkit. This is the packaged workaround that I have to let you do, I think, some, some reasonable real physics modeling inside of Unity Game Engine, uh, including uh, adding some threaded updates to, to, to simplify some things, uh, an integrator class, uh, and double precision mathematics in a way that's a little bit easier to use. And also, uh, I'm going to show some examples of this, but you can also find this, uh, put it on a blog post online uh, with some downloads. Will you be able to download the sample code that I'm going to show today? So um, in terms of some demos here, first I'm going to bring up just a real quick uh, look at Unity and the Unity Modeling Toolkit for how we can set up a simple system uh, and the tools to use it. I'm going to go through it a little bit quick because it's, you know, it's kind of this, you know, 10 to 15 minute talk range, which is not enough for a full coding walkthrough. Uh, and then I'll show the more complicated version of this where we implement it with uh, the Leonard Jones, uh, the Leonard Jones gas. So first, this is going to be real basic. It's, you know, simple harmonic oscillator problem. Um, and we have a, a model in our scene. Again, if you've not used Unity before, Unity has a scene in which things can live, uh, a rendered view of what the camera will see, a hierarchy of all the different things that so you can go in and look at them, uh, an inspector to change elements of that, uh, as well as a folder structure to find and, and organize all of your items. So we have a scene file. Um, there is a model which is going to um, do some math and a sphere. And you'll notice my model has a thing to move, which is going to point to the sphere. So the model, and I need to do some, I'm going to do some kind of crazy screen sharing here because I just realized I'm going through about four different applications. I will do a full screen share. Uh, so the model is going to uh, override something we include in the Unity Modeling Toolkit. Unity Modeling Toolkit, uh, I call it Time Step Model, which is basically just an integration um, routine for you. We define values. We say, when we take a step, what does that step mean? This could be um, the integrator class, or if you just want to write code that's not based around uh, you just do simple turn-based code, that can be done there as well. And we have an update routine. So the override of take step is this threaded step. And uh, our um, update is our screen refresh. So we break apart the idea of how do we redraw the screen and how do we move the math forward. Our math, again, we set our initial conditions. We set our rates of change. All of that is sitting on top of this time step model, which is provided in this which allows for a threaded running of a standard Unity model. And the integrator class, which is allowing for the, the solution of the differential equations. I press run and uh, get solution. And we can see real quickly the difference between threaded and non-threaded in terms of, uh, you know, if I'm essentially calculating updates at a fixed time interval or with screen updates versus just kind of throwing all the calculation in a thread and, and letting that be independent. Um, for some things that you want things to have a very good control over the time, but sometimes with more complicated complicated calculations, you really kind of want that to be able to run in the background. So let's see, hopefully everyone can see this here. So what I want to show is this applied to our Leonard Jones model. Uh, just a reminder for the Leonard Jones potential. The Leonard Jones potential uh, is a, uh, a molecular or interatomic force that's designed 
to mimic a long range attraction and a short range repulsion. So as things are pulled in, but as they get closer, uh, there's a short range repulsion. And we see that here. Um, so we've implemented that. I've written it down here as potential, but we can take the derivative of that to get the force. Um, I've implemented that here. So if I look at my integrator, we can see that for our uh, rates of change. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Rates of change are the rates of change. Um, for our rates of change, calling rates of change two, where is that? Uh, we have our, you know, standard thing if we've looked at you know, getting into a force calculation for n body, going through flattening this out into an array and figuring in, we have a drag and a, a randomness added to it. And uh, we create a list of nearby items. Uh, one issue with uh, the linear joint potential is we're looking at primarily near near range interactions. This is a potential that's, you know, R to the six in one term and R to the 12th in another. So this is not a super long range force. Uh, so we want to look near range, but we also, for our periodic box that we're going to put it in, we want to be able to kind of ghost things around and figure out, well, wait a second, what if this thing over there would be better figured as a ghost particle nearby? We keep track of that and ultimately go through and calculate our in-body solution, calculate the accelerations and put it in. So uh, the model has the um, uh, the periodic box included in that, as well as Leonard Jones potential. And again, in terms of setting this up and running it, uh, we're going to set up the initial conditions. We're going to allow it to be threaded. Um, and when we take a step, we're just going to move forward, force that periodic. The model itself, again, in this instant ring credit store is basically take this integration and run it. And every so often, we're going to update our positions on the screen. So I start this and try to pause it really fast. So if we look at our model's initial conditions, we're going to start with our periodic box. Our particles are randomly distributed through the box. And one of the things I really like about the rendering process in Unity is we can get pretty fancy in terms of transparency of the objects and the way it looks. Um, and let it run for, whoops, we start that. It was running threaded. We jumped to the punchline. Um, so our particles move around. You notice we can see them. Uh, we can see that they are kind of bouncing out of the walls here and going in, wrapping around periodically. And what happens with, you know, this long-term attraction, short-term repulsion, uh, with a little bit of drag and a little bit of randomness is the particles start to clump together and form uh, areas where things are, are packed as solids, probably a strong word for this, but packed uh, locally. Uh, and then we can see the structures that start to develop. And I think one thing that it so the smaller ones, it's easier to see. Uh, if we look at that, we see that they're starting to pack and lattice structures are starting to form in 3D. Um, one of the fun tricks of doing these things with Unity, and I actually found this bug this morning testing this out. Uh, if your students are doing these things and building them with you know balls and objects in Unity, Unity tries to build some of its own physics into it. So be sure to turn all of that off. In this case, I had to make sure no colliders were on any object. Uh, and I know the colliders are all turned off because I can lie through it uh, without colliding with it. Um, so those spacings are real. That's not something uh, enforced by the game engine. That is strictly the game engine displaying the result of the mathematics. Uh, and again, so that's a thousand particles calculated uh, in real time in 3D with rendering on that. Um, so again, I think a nice example of where you can go with Unity to take some of the things that we do a lot as examples in 1 and 2D in the classroom and think about kind of a, a high-end 3D rendering in, engine coupled with the modeling. If you can take care of things double precision, having an integrator, and, and ideally making use of C-sharp's threaded nature to throw that computing off into a thread in the background and get that Unity modeling toolkit 
uh, is there for you to download to help you with that. And I will stop there for the Linda Jones 3D model part of the presentation. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think our next speaker is uh, is Robert Panoff. Good. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what I call many body for anybody. I spent the last couple of years working on a gen ed course at Wofford College. Uh, this is for people that are either have no background in programming, very weak background in math. We're trying to give them the experience of what computing can do in the sciences without requiring them to program themselves, but to give them an experience by seeing what programs can do to want to learn the programming, to want to learn it themselves. So we'll talk a little bit about the difference between computational physics education, which is what I've been doing mostly lately, which is using computer models, tools, and simulations to teach the concepts of physics, biology, chemistry, as opposed to what Dave's been talking about recently, which is computational physics education, actually teaching how to solve the equations, how to do the integrations, and pulling all of these things together. So by coincidence, he showed you one form of the Leonard Jones potential. He wrote the sigma over R to the 12th term first instead of the R minus sigma over R to the 12th term second. Therefore, I've got a minus sign because typically the potential is going to be attractive over most of the range. And I want the students to see that it's attractive. I also want them to understand how to interpret things that may seem unreasonable to them. If R is exactly equal to sigma, then this is one to the six minus one to the six, which is identically zero. So sigma is the location of the hard core or soft core. It's the repulsive part of the equation. You can tell that by inspection. But what's often confusing to students is if epsilon is a constant and if four is a constant, then why not just multiply four times epsilon and suck it in and make it a constant? And the reason for that has to do with the ability of looking at the equation and understanding what it's able to do. Let me see if I can get this here. So we've been using a computational tool for several years now called the multifunction data flyer, where we can put the Leonard Jones potential or any other function. And one of the things that you can see is that if I move, if I change sigma and make it bigger, that point where it crosses zero changes. And you can see dynamically, visually, and interactively that sigma really is the zero crossing. But by factoring out the four, Look at the purpleness of this function. What you see is by factoring out the four, epsilon is the well depth of the potential. And that's hard to tell because normally what you get in a book is one equation and one graph for one set of parameters. And by using a computational tool like the multifunction data flyer, a student can experiment for different parameters and come to a more physical, guttural understanding, a visceral understanding of why do we write these things the way we write them, because that's what they look like. By factoring out the four, what we're left with is the ability of picking off the well depth from the rest of the equation. Let me get back here. So what I'm going to talk about is what do we mean by many? I saw this comic a couple of years ago and I figured 
it kind of frustrates people by what we mean by many. And normally by many, we mean more than two. If you go to graduate school, you spend most of your first semester, sometimes two semesters in quantum mechanics, studying the one electron atom. Maybe you get two electrons. But in terms of really many body physics, you spend a lot of time on one, two, and then more than two objects of what you're having in there. And so when we talk about things, we got to get the one and two objects right. So when we talk about either evolving a system through the state of the system, it's either going to evolve because we're going to have forces move the particles in the system, or we're going to have energies affect the position or state of the system. And we all almost... In most elementary physics classes, we have this idea that we start with the position, we calculate the force, we divide by the mass to get the acceleration. The acceleration changes the velocity. The velocity gives us a new position, and we do this over and over again. And the difference between doing this for one body, which is about all the maths most students can handle, and many body is just the repetitious tediousness of the calculation. And that's where the computation can play a big role in deciding what kind of problems. So if you break it down, you can solve it in something as simple as Excel. But what I've been doing is using system modeling to do the conceptual part of the physics, again, to avoid the programming. I've been using system modeling because we, we can essentially use definitional approaches so by having a diagrammatic approach, we can add complexity to the model without forcing the students to learn a lot of programming. So forces change the momentum. The momentum causes a change in the in the rate of change of the, of the position. Once you know the position, then you can go back. And what I want the students to understand is that if the force is constant, the momentum is going to be linear. If the momentum is linear, the position is going to be quadratic. And the introduction of drag essentially is going to offset the constant force and can reduce the force to zero. If the force is reduced to zero, the momentum approaches a constant if the momentum approaches a constant, the falling body is going to approach linear behavior. And conceptually, that's a big deal for a lot of these students. All they've learned is algebraic memorization in high school. But when they come here, they can actually understand what's going on. And again, it's done computationally by connecting a dynamic visual and interactive presentation. They're getting a representation which is graphical and they're learning to compare constant linear and quadratic behavior and relating those together and seeing that as they grab these things and change them, what's the difference between air resistance and drag? What is the difference between a constant force and a linear force? And these things that are sort of going on there. So then getting back to the other examples I want to share with you. If we had a single falling body, that would be one thing. But what if we had many, 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 many falling bodies that were all falling next next to each other? So for a number of years and a number of people, Dave worked on one version of this code that we could have a galaxy which has some kind of spherical randomized positions, hundreds, hundreds. This is going to have tens of thousands of couple differential equations. If we start off with a cloud of gas that has no initial velocity, it's just n objects held gravitationally that let go. If we start this off,
I don't know if you can tell, so I'm going to put on a box in each of the directions. What you're seeing is that if they start off with zero initial velocity, you have a symmetric gravitational infall and a blob of gas, a blob of stars, a blob of clusters of stars will, will rush into the middle and give you this, this infall where you have this high galactic halo in the middle and then sort of a following sense of going on there. And it allows you to answer the question that after 3 billion years, starting with the cloud of gas gravitational infall, what you end up with are globular clusters. And you can answer driving questions like, why are some of the things we see in the sky spherical and nebulous, and some of them are, are flat like spirals? So we could come back here and, and re-randomize and give them an initial rotation. So I'm going to just give a little bit of trace so you can believe that they're really rotating. But what you may or may not be able to see is that while they're rotating in this direction, in the plane of rotation, they're really not falling in. But perpendicular to the rate of rotation, there's actually a gravitational infall where that spherical blob is now collapsing into a disk. And again, after two to three billion years of, of gravitational infall, what you end up with is a sphere that's starting to have these kinds of Spi spiral formations, but the difference between a, a flat disk object and a globular object is whether or not at the time that this dust cloud was allowed to have gravity take over, was there an angular momentum? And that's a driving question that you know can be solved with F equals ma, except it's F equals ma with tens of thousands of simultaneously solved difference equations. Now, if you, instead of using forces, we can also solve things based on different types of energy. I like to talk about an analogy where you're looking at the distribution of lacrosse players in the locker room if you take the sweat of one player times the sweat of the other divided by the distance between them, you can calculate the annoyance in the locker room and determine how far apart lacrosse players will stand after a game. Or you can talk about gravitational or potential energy. And this gives you a two-dimensional view of these are electrically charged particles which are repulsive to each other. This is the energy of the system. If I actually take a particle and bring it closer to another particle, the energy goes up. If I bring it close to the wall, the energy goes up. So the question is, we use this to teach the algorithm of simulated annealing so that we can actually simulate annealing. So each particle is using a classical variational Monte Carlo algorithm. And then you could sort of come up here with your coarse atomic microscope and move particles into different configurations and try to determine, could you have another stable configuration? And if you heated up the system a little bit, then it's going to return to the ground state. Then we can calculate the electrostatic potential. by using the Laplace relaxation method, which is basically, I am the average of my neighbors, but you're doing it 90,000 times over and over and over 
and looking at what's the cost of assembling this system of charges coming up and over so that you could do something like this by hand, but it would take you forever. But computationally, you can do it. We also use it for teaching the difference between different ways of visualizing things with different color palettes. I got this idea from Donna Cox 20 years ago at NCSA, looking at different ways. If you use all the colors in the desert, you wouldn't get much information. If you looked at lava waves, you'd get a lot more and you can look for equipotential surfaces and figuring out how things are going. You could come over and, and do experiments and decide, you know, if you had a certain number of particles in the box. If you had seven particles in the box, what would be the ground state orientation? What very few people would do is determine that it would look like an arrow pointing into one of four directions. We can teach the concept of degeneracy again, because if the arrow can point to one corner, it could point to any one of the four corners. Happens like flipping a coin, getting heads the same way twice. On the other hand, if we came over here and increased the repulsion on the walls to make it much more repulsive, and squeeze harder, then we can get things that were seen by IBM in terms of atomic force potentials, in terms of different crystallization conditions of things that are coming in, and then coming off and looking at So the basic idea is that we can look at n objects and look at some much more interesting things than a single falling body or two charged particles repelling each other or simple harmonic oscillators. We can do much more exciting things conceptually in a classroom that would get kids excited about different sciences. We also do many body physics with predator-prey problems and pandemic problems. Those are essentially similar many body problems, but they're not physics problems. But the only complication is it takes computational power in order to be able to, to, to bring them into the classroom. And what I'm trying to do is to bring that computation into the classroom to motivate the learning of programming not requiring the programming first in order to bring it into the classroom. Tag to Ruben. Wow, okay. Are you ready for me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ruben. Okay, I'll start. Well, uh, nice to be here. It's been a while since I've faced a group like you. Anyway, uh, last summer, uh, one of the editors at Wiley asked if we wanted to update our 2015 computational physics text uh, to make a fourth edition. And that seemed a little weird. Uh, I'd know if there was that much interest in it, but I thought it'd be nice to look at some of the new things that have happened in physics and science over the last decade and see if we could uh, put them in. I asked my co-author if we could do this, uh, Manuel Paez, the third one has passed away. He was the youngest of the lot. And my co-author thought, the bodies may ache, but our minds are still good. Yeah, we can do it. So we started and the, uh, enter. okay. So uh, I'd like today to, discuss four of the additions to this new text that we added, because uh, I think they're the kind of subjects which 
physicists can teach. They're of interest to physics. They're of interest to all of society. So the first will be uh, neural networks and its relation and artificial intelligence. Uh, and that's part of this general trend, which we have several chapters on, of data mining, which has become very popular. It's data analysis as far as we're concerned. Uh, the set, second new subject is quantum computing. And there too, you know, the basis of it is pretty simple. Physicists could, would like that. The actual state-of-the-art machines and possibilities go beyond uh, what I think we could do at this undergraduate, up at division undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, and the third topic, which I'll mention is principal component analysis, still part of data mining. We had a little bit of this in our previous books. Uh, but now we expanded it. It's become more important, as has data mining. So let's get on. Uh, the first topic of interest would be neural networks and artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a subject I studied as an undergraduate, so I was very interested in learning more about it. And the whole basis is... Yeah, stop sharing and then restart. So, uh, okay, so, you know, neural networks is the basis of artificial intelligence. And it all started maybe 50 years ago with McCulloch and Pitts. And they essentially looked at a neuron as a, a binary device. The dendrites get a signal. Uh, internally, it, it decides whether to transmit a signal or not. And so it's a yes, no decision. And boom, if it decides to, then it sends it out. And then each on the other end, the synthetic uh, dendrites then connect to more dendrites. So when you put it all together, you get a neural net, which is what the brain is. And what's nice with physics is that one can model very simply, as you have right here, this is just a computer model of a neuron. We have, in this case, two inputs. Each gets weighted by a certain amount. Uh, that's fine. We jump to the next slide. Uh, Do you want me we to go go back? One, please. Each gets weighted by a certain amount then gets processed inside, and then a signal comes out or it doesn't come out. Uh, so this is pretty much the simple device. Now the next slide, please. Okay, so we can actually put together a bunch of these neurons and make a simple neural network. And that's quite interesting for a physicist because it's a basic principles. And if you could understand artificial intelligence from the basic simple ideas, then you could see how it's built up more. So what we have here on the bottom is a Python program of a neuron. So, you know, so this does what a neuron does in a simple way with biases and weights you can put in. And then you have above here, a very simple neural network of uh, <clears throat> two neurons put together and they prov provide an output. And with a simple network like this, you can actually teach it to do things. You know, if you work hard, it does a little bit bit better than getting things right on the average. But the point is, it does get things right. It does learn. And you've seen how you can learn with a very simple neural network, which is the basis of artificial intelligence. So why don't we go on? Sorry, I wasted so much time. Next slide, please. Okay. Quantum computing is a very hot topic. Uh, it's based on being able to use quantum bits or qubits to store information with. Uh, and here, and one can have many, many states, but here uh, in a bell type diagram, one has two simple quantum states, what we would call spin states could be up or down, uh, but in quantum computing up is called zero and down is called one. Okay, so that's just how it goes. Uh, and you can see one has higher dimensionality in space when you're dealing with qubits, even just two qubits. So quantum computing is actually done at a very primitive level, something maybe some of us learned or never learned, never had to learn, but it's basically just dealing with gates and simple uh, input and output, and then trying to build up more complex mathematical processes from these gates. So uh, we can look at the next slide. One of the very neat things with quantum computing in a classroom is that you can actually use free online simulators or free online actually physical quantum computers. So here's a screenshot of 
using the IBM quantum computer. So one signs up, one gets a uh, an account, and it starts off with a whole bunch of these little buttons you push, and these are the various gates to do things with. Uh, and you know, and you you have the states here being shown. Here we have a simple program. And here you see that bell sphere for whatever one qubit was. You start with nothing. And it, as you build it up, it shows you what it's like in 3D space. And so what you see here, oh, you can't move it over. Uh, what you see here is a basic combination of H, two H gates and a rotation gate acting on two quantum qubits, two states. And this performs a Fourier transform using just two qubits. So it's a very nice example of uh, how you have to program, which is painful, but also how you can do some sophisticated mathematics with just a couple of qubits and uh, some of these gates. So that's an example of quantum computing. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. One of the topics which uh, we mentioned before in the book, but we didn't get into it, but now has become even more important, is what's goes by various names, uh, principal component analysis may be the most popular. And this is, oh, it's become more popular now because uh, the, the, uh, the magnitude of data that is being analyzed has increased with computing power over the last decade, particularly. So here we're talking about looking at time, often time, space, correlated data when one can have many, many detectors, many, many can be hundreds or thousands, each detector analyzing signals at maybe hundreds or thousands or, th or millions of times. So you have a multi-dimensional data space with various data points in this space at time and uh, space. And the data can be have noise. The data can also have correlations between the detectors. They may be... Uh, measuring the same signal, they may not be. So one really needs a statistical approach to figure out what's going on. And that's what principal component analysis does for you. It takes, could be these you know, huge uh, gigabytes of data and able to discern what are the main dynamical features in those data, what are the most important ones. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and it does that by looking at computing covariance matrices, also known as a singular value decomposition. But essentially, you, you look at the variance of each detector, you multiply those together in some way, and then you get the joint covariance for the whole signal data space, excuse me. <clears throat> and usually, in physics, we think if there's a lot of variance, that means there's a lot of noise, and that's a noisy signal. Well, here, when, you, when you're when you dealing with this kind of data set, you sort of have the inverse approach. If there's a lot of variance coming in one particular detector here, so this is detector A, for example, it's X position, it's Y position, looking at correlations. And if there's a large variation going on, that seems to signal a high level of dynamics happening, something interesting. So that's an interesting part of the signal. So when Reed defines the space you look at, you do a, 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 a coordinate a rotation for the principal axes, which is where the name comes from, where the most data is varying. So with the, whereas the most dynamics happening, that's what you want to be look at, look at. So that's your principal signal. And then a perpendicular orthogonal axis would be your second component look along there. So in these new axes, you have major data where the major dynamics of the signal is along one axis and the second axis having a lower, presumably power as it's called in the data. So if we go to the next slide, please. And this is an analysis of uh, an actual space-time correlation. And what you'll see here, you can click on this, Richard, please. It should be a, a JPEG, it should start moving. Yeah, it doesn't move for me. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So this this is the for the, this is a uh, data analysis of a flame, uh, ro uh, a burning signal, which is where a good example. So this would be the main mode. This is where most of the energy is, and that's what it looks like in space. Uh, here is when you add the main mode to the second principal component analysis. You can see. 
75% of the power in the signal comes from the main mode. And then this is the second, you know, one, two, three, four modes. And these are all the modes added together. So this is the total signal you're getting. This is what the main mode looks like. So this is an example of, of what it's like. Uh, so do we have any more? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. That's the last so, slide. Okay, so, so that's an example of the... Care. Fine. That's, those are three examples of the new topics which I think are open for physics students to understand from basic, each of which, each of which can be uh, approached from very basic principles. And they're very popular, very important now. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Are there uh, questions or comments? So, Ruben, do you want to make any uh, predictions about when quantum computing might actually become useful? Well, I mean, I be, you know, they're, they're, they're building these, these computers now. I think some of them uh, have, I think you can get up to five qubits. Uh, so the answer would be, it's not for everyday computing. We won't be transplant, replaced by a quantum computer very soon. But, you know, if you can do some very, very complicated problems like uh, uh, spyware and decoding messages uh, with a very small amount data set, uh, that would happen. But no, I mean, there's billions of dollars being spent now on this, uh, trying to develop it. So it's it may be decades. No, it's and even that, that quantum computer we use at IBM, the physical one, is based on AC Josephson junctions. And you run some programs with we do two four qubits. Uh, there's still error and noise in it, so that, you know there are problems. You know, these aren't really atoms that you're using now. You're using uh, electronic devices, so uh, presumably people are trying to use atoms at a more basic level, but that's yet to come. Noah's Ark had three hundred qubits. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh... So I'll show a picture that's apropos of, uh, of Bob's talk. And he talked about, um, right, uh, confining, essentially confining particles to a region and, and that are repulsive and looking at the patterns. And uh, let me uh, go back to and, uh, and share my screen here. So this is an experiment that we do with our first year physics majors. And what you're looking at here, um, where my pointer is, is a copper uh, sheet of, of copper with a triangle that's been machined out of it. And the bright spots here, these are uh, one millimeter diameter uh, stainless steel non-magnetic stainless steel balls. And this is between a parallel plate capacitor made out of two pieces of, of uh, conducting glass. Um, and then there's a, um, a, a vibration table underneath the whole thing that allows you to anneal the system down to its ground state. Uh, so these balls are actually get charged as quadrupoles um, and students can investigate the ground states of various configurations. And we have not only uh, triangles, but we've got circulars, circular and elliptical and rectangular templates as well. And so we're kind of doing Bob's experiment physically. Um, and then in our advanced lab, we also have them uh, run some simulated annealing code so that they can compare their computational experiment to the data. I had a question for Dave about uh, three-dimensional molecular dynamics, whether uh, you actually form some crystals, you have some models where the three-dimensional structures that form a crystal? Um, so for this one, what we see with this, at least in the, the model we were running, we do see uh, that hexagonal lattice forming. Um, if you let it run long enough, let's share the screen. I'll run it again. So 
given enough time, uh, this will start to settle into a, uh, a hexagonal pattern and you can kind of view it and see it. The smaller ones are starting to get there already. You can kind of see it in that 2D view. Uh, if you look at it uh, where it's only a layer thin, we can kind of see that happening already. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, and when you leave it long enough, the kind of the neat thing with this is those uh, little nuclei in each of those uh, uh, particles will start to line up where the, you can kind of zoom through it and see where the symmetries are. But it does take a little longer running to get to get things to line up quite that nice. Actually, we're starting to see it there. You can kind of see it like a line right here. I don't know if you can see that. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 So I thought that was neat to come out of of uh, uh, those uh, those three D structures. And like I said, this was this was inspired by the by the 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 two D model in your book, where essentially you you see the same thing. You see that uh, uh, everything falling into those hexagonal patterns with these with these uh, computational runs. Nice. Very nice. I've been I've been very happy with kind of the the look and feel that you get out of uh, Unity for these things, but it definitely takes a little uh, a little bit of uh, tweaking to get to get everything to run in a way where you can trust the physics. So, what's the next frontier to help students understand these concepts better? What, what what's the next challenge in front of each of you that are teaching this stuff? Well, at the gen ed level, it's trying to make the multiple representations reasonable, able to be reasoned with, with the equation and the data and the graph and the visualizations giving different insights into what's going on in the physical system. And we're, we seem to be getting some traction. We're getting kids out of the gen ed class, going into the sciences, going into computer science, going into physics. So they're coming in without any idea what they're doing. And the course I teach is kind of sampling the sciences. They get a little bit of astronomy, biology, chemistry, engineering, physics, pandemics, sword fights, Dragons, true love, you know, we, <laughs> you know, they get a little bit of everything. I think on the uh, Bob was talking about computational physics education versus computational physics education, and I think uh, for me on the on the kind of the algorithmic side of things, the thing I keep noticing is the degree to which these you know neural network models and and now uh, uh, and transformer models and, and now some of these large language models uh, kind of upend what would have classically been uh, algorithms that would be go tos and this you know so Bob was showing off simulated annealing and we had been doing some computer vision projects uh, picking out some data from from some uh, 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 microscope scans. And our initial approach had been using simulated annealing as a minimization algorithm to figure out like where, where was the best kind of match of what we thought we were looking for versus where it was. And uh, I had a student who had been had working on this in a year, tweaking things. We started in Python. We wrote a, we rewrote and see the optimized and went through all this stuff. And then I had another student who kind of came onto the project late. And I'm like, you know, I just got to give this person something to get them going this year. Well, why don't you use, you know, the Facebook uh, uh, Debtor uh, transformer model. Just see if you could, you know, do some image training on that, and, and how will it compare? And you know, in two weeks, he comes back and it's like, yeah, yeah, it works. Here's this, and of course, the performance comparison was just so much, so much better. The the, <laughs> the quality of what we were getting from what I thought was going to be this, yeah, well, why don't you go look at the neural network thing and see how it works? Um, I've been surprised at how many traditional algorithms uh, can be done with, you know, some of these neural network approaches instead. And I think that's, that's kind of uh, um, where I think we're looking at, at where things are changing algorithmically. So I was really glad to see that added into uh, 
uh, your updates, Ruben. Okay, oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's being used in astronomy in a, in a big way. Yeah. Well, I think that, Scott, is sort of the challenge uh, for the physics students. You know, we have all this very powerful computational tools out there with the computer science. AI is one, quantum computing. And uh, physics has to sort of fit in someplace. And I think you know, the what basic is the idea is to understand a few basic principles, and then you know what's going on better, uh, I think. From what you hear online, people talking about artificial intelligence, it's clear they don't understand what's really going on in some ways. Yep. All right, are there any other final questions? I'd like to thank the speakers today and uh, appreciate your uh, uh, giving us a pretty broad view of how you use uh, computation in the, your classrooms and uh, uh, which uh, we'll get this uh, recording ed edited a bit and uploaded uh, to the uh, SIG HPC uh, education um, YouTube channel sometime in the next few days.